James. For those who were present with us, uh, the series of sermons that we just recently concluded on the efficacy of prayer found us numerous times either reading or at least referencing a rather familiar verse in James. So let me invite you to start there, James 5 and verse 16. James 5 and verse 16, toward the middle of the verse, it reads, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now you can appreciate why we would have opportunity to note that verse in talking about the efficacy of prayer. I'm not suggesting in any way that that's the only verse, because the Bible is, again, replete with passages that affirm the fact that prayers avail much. Prayers are effective. They're efficacious. Uh, but certainly you can appreciate this might be one of the most clear affirmations of that. As James, again, writing by the Holy Spirit, states it very clearly. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I trust that that series had its intended objective. Again, we were trying to offer reasons as to why we should have the utmost confidence in the efficacy of prayers. Now, obviously, that is conditioned upon their being offered in keeping with God's prescribed um, ways of acceptable prayer. But having done that, we should believe, we should be confident, we should be assured that our prayers are efficacious. Uh, we offered these reasons because of who God is. God is powerful, therefore He's able to answer prayer, our prayers. God is faithful, so He is trustworthy when He says, I will answer your prayers. And then God presents Himself as our Father. And Jesus even argues this on the Sermon on the Mount. Think about you in your relationship as a father to your son. If your son would ask you something, would you give it to him? If it was for his good? Would you mock him by giving him something that he didn't need or that would be to his detriment? Well, if you, being human fathers, and by comparison evil, he said, if you would do that, how much more your father in heaven? And so the very representation of God as our father should give us confidence that when we as his children approach his throne, seeking petitions of him, that he is ready, willing, able to grant them. And then we talked about what God has done. And in that study, we basically looked at occasions where the Bible provides for us substantive evidence, testimony, witness of those prayers that have been uh, answered by God. And uh, so hopefully that has, again, been a, a helpful study uh, in encouraging us not only to have confidence in the efficacy of our prayers, but then that translate into our praying more regularly, more frequently. That was kind of a, a side objective, uh, because until we are confident that our prayers are doing good, it's very unlikely that we're going to spend the time or invest the energy in praying regularly as God would have us to. All right, so James, again, um, going back to where we started, James sets forth the efficacy of prayer, James 5, 16. But I find it interesting, James also, in that small, short epistle of five chapters, also allows us to know sometimes our prayers, even as Christians, will not be answered. We'll come back and visit these a little later in our study, really the bulk of our study. But just to call attention to that, look at James chapter 1. At the end of, well, let's look at verse 6. At the, oh, well, we'll even drop down to, to verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, James makes that statement, as we will come to appreciate a little later in our study, he makes that statement in connection with prayer. And again, he is addressing Christians to whom he is writing. And he says, if you pray in this way, you shouldn't have confidence that you're going to receive anything of the Lord. Now, does that discount the efficacy of prayer? No. It just speaks to the possibility of something that would hinder our prayers from being efficacious. 
Notice again, James chapter 4. Look at James chapter 4. Verse 3. Again, we're going to come back and revisit these, look at their context a little more in depth, but just look at the language. Verse 3, ye ask. Again, he's talking to Christians. You Christians, you ask and receive not. Now again, does that discount the efficacy of prayer? Does that in any way challenge what Jesus taught about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount when He said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. But here, James, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, says, You ask, and you don't receive. You don't receive. So James 5 and verse 16 clearly affirms the efficacy of prayer. But James also would have us understand there are things that can be hindrances to our prayer's efficacy. Things that can interfere with God's answering our prayers. And again, it's not because of God. It's because of us. And so that brings us to our current series. Having talked about the efficacy of prayer and giving us reasons as to why we should have confidence in that, and hopefully translating into our praying more regularly, more frequently, more consistently, we now turn our attention to potential hindrances to our prayer's efficacy. Because James allows us to know that's possible. That's possible. And again, Christians, would it not be tragic? Wouldn't it be tragic? Were we to somehow obstruct or interrupt or completely shut off or somehow hinder the unlimited resources of heaven from us as God's people by ineffective prayer? Now, the first thing we set forth was uh, much like what we had talked about as it related to the efficacy of prayer. Friends, any, any prerequisite that God sets forth that is required of Him for acceptable prayer, any of those that we fail to comply with makes our prayers ineffective. But we're trying to delve a little deeper by identifying some specific hindrances to our prayers being effective. And again, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. But I do hope we understand the importance of it. Wanting our prayers to be effective. Wanting us to have that confidence. Well then, by identifying some potential hindrances to that, it should call to our attention the need to be very careful, very diligent in looking out for those. So when they do appear in our spiritual lives, we're going to immediately address them so that we can remove those potential hindrances and, again, bolster our confidence in the efficacy of prayer. So, the first one we talked about was persistency in sin. Friends, impenitent sin, unrepented sin, will render our prayers ineffective. Uh, God in His Word reminds us of that time and again, both Old and New Testaments. Peter, quoting from the Old Testament, said this, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Again, from the Proverbs, uh, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Again, not well received by God. Now again, we can see application of that as it relates to those who are not in covenant relationship with God. Those who cannot call upon God as their Father should find no confidence in their prayers unless their prayers, like Cornelius and and like Saul of Tarsus, were for God to reveal to them the means of being in a right relationship with Him. But otherwise, they should find no confidence in it because why? Well, they're still living in sin. And that is what will separate us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. But friends, it also has application to Christians. In fact, that's who Peter was writing to. He's writing to us. 
It was David, who was a man after God's own heart, in covenant relationship with God, who said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He was talking about himself personally. And we also see that as it relates under the Old Testament, God's disregard for His covenant people, Israel, when they live lives of sin and then tried to come in and offer prayers to Him, He says, I will not listen. I will not hear them. But then we turned our attention to a second potential hindrance to prayer. And we want to conclude that one today. That one has to do with insincerity. Insincerity can hinder our prayer's efficacy. Jesus makes that very clear, very clear. In addressing those that He styled hypocrites, play actors. That that was the word for a play actor back in, you know, Greek, Grecian times, in in that period of time. They were acting. They, They were putting on a play. They were putting on an ostentious show. For God, no. For their fellow man. And this hypocrisy that so, was so prevalent in even religious leaderships of Jesus' day, the scribes, the Pharisees, uh, other religious leaders of His day, He says it was very apparent and it manifested itself in how they were praying. See, it was not the case that they weren't praying. That wasn't the deficiency. They were praying. But Jesus there in Matthew chapter 6, He, he makes it very clear why they were praying. See, that was the problem. It was their heart. He says they would stand in the street corner. They would stand in a conspicuous place in the synagogue. Why? So that they could be seen of men. That was their motive. That was their incentive. They were not really trying to do what prayer affords us, have communion with God. Their audience wasn't God. Their audience was their fellow man. And Jesus makes it very clear that such a prayer, such an insincere prayer, was ineffective. Because here's what He said. They will get no reward from heaven. He said the reward they're looking for is the reward they'll get. They wanted other people to say, hey, you must be very faithful, religious, pious men. He says that's what they'll get, but they'll get no reward from heaven. And so we talked about potentially our interfering with prayer's efficacy by being like those religious leaders of Jesus' day who He styled hypocrites. They weren't sincere. They were doing it for the wrong motives. And friends, that could happen in our private prayers. Hence, Jesus says, go to your closet. Get away. Get away from the potential temptation of doing something to be seen by others because your Father who is in secret, He'll see you there. But also in public prayers. And that's really where the Really where the temptation comes, Ricky. Because in our public prayers, now all of a sudden, we're wording a prayer for others. But we have to remember, the prayer is still to God. And if we're wording that prayer in such a way as to impress our human hearers, well, we have joined the hypocrites of Jesus' day. We're putting on a show. And so we said, friends, you could have the most articulate, eloquently styled, worded prayer that would seem very appealing to man, and God refuses it. See, it's important for us to understand God to whom we are offering up our prayers, He doesn't just hear the words. He knows the heart from which those words issue. Brother Tolles in his little workbook, I've referenced it a number of times in our both of these studies, but he said, you know, the words are just the shell in which the life itself is preserved. And, and we can relate to that today, right? In springtime, you plant a seed. Where's the life? It's in the shell. That's just the shell. And so in the same way, the words that we offer up to God, they're just, they're just a shell. But God's looking at the heart. In fact, He told some of those Pharisees on one occasion, God knows your heart. He knows our hearts. So we have to be careful with regards to 
in sincerity as it relates to private and public prayers. We talked about also the potential of vain repetitions. And I failed to say this last week. Friends, that is not Jesus' prohibiting repeating prayers. You know how I know that? The Garden of Gethsemane. What does it say about Jesus? You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? He told His disciples, stay back, brought three, Peter, James, and John a little closer, and then He went about a stone's pace. He fell on His face and prayed. He went back, found His disciples sleeping. He reproved them, went, and it says, and He prayed the same words. How many times? Three times. Jesus isn't prohibiting repeating prayers. In fact, He told men should pray and not to faint. And He gave the illustration of a widow who was so importunist, I'm not even sure how to say that word as an adjective, or importunist, but in, in other words, she kept going back to that judge, and the judge says, I'm not going to answer her request because I'm God-fearing or because I regard her. She's pestering me. And I'm going to answer it just to get her away from me. And he was using that by way of contrast. If that's what a judge would do, who doesn't fear God, who doesn't have any regard for that woman, what do you think God does when you are constantly coming to Him? Because He does love us. He does care for us. So friends, Jesus is not prohibiting repetition of prayers. What He is prohibiting is vain repetitions. The word means empty. Now, I'm not sure how that was manifesting itself in that day and time. He talks about the Gentiles. We're we're not familiar with, you know, unbelievers who maybe go around chanting or whatever. But, But, friends, we could be guilty of a form of that if our prayers are just by memory, really have no meaning. We're just repeating what we've heard others say. God knows. God knows our hearts. He's looking at our hearts. That's what's most important to Him. Then we also talked about the need to be constantly recognizing prayer is a mental exercise. <laughs> and there are, no passive mem- there are no passive participants. If somebody else is leading the prayer, you still should be praying. You're not passive. You need to be mentally engaged. And in our day and time, with all the distractions that are available, notwithstanding just the natural distractions that come by thoughts, you can see how important it is. All right, but... I wanted to mention two more, as time permits the day, but I wanted to mention two more that come from the book of James. In fact, they are given in connection with those verses that we just looked at. And I'm not sure if there's necessarily a real close tie here to insincerity, uh, but possibly, possibly this is the best place in our study to mention them, and I believe they are worthy of our consideration. So let me invite you back to the book of James. and We'll look at the first one there. And again, maybe this is, or this certainly is a potential hindrance to prayer's efficacy, and it could be possibly characterized by this idea of insincerity. Insincerity. I mentioned verse 7, Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Well, who is that man? Well, let's back up. All of this starts in verse 5, where James says, If any of you lack wisdom, and he just told us to rejoice, (laughs) <laughs> rejoice when various temptations and trials come into our lives. Do you find that difficult? You, you think you might be saying, hey, how do I do that? I need some help with that. Well, if you lack wisdom in that, James says, ask God. Let him ask of God. And notice how God is characterized here, that giveth to all men liberally. He doesn't upbraid. He, he doesn't cast it back into your f- teeth and Sometimes, like we do, you know, with our children, well, you just asked me for that last week. God doesn't do that. And notice the assurance, and it shall be given him. You pray to God for wisdom, God says it will be given to you. However, verse 6, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. The American Standard Version uses the word doubting. For he that wavereth or doubteth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. That's the man, verse 7, that should not think that he will receive anything 
of the Lord. Now, we already spent a little bit of time talking about this under our previous series with regards to the efficacy of prayer. Because, friends, we there pointed out this is one of those criteria by God, one of those prerequisites by God for acceptable prayer. You have to believe, you have to have confidence that in asking the prayer, God will answer you. And here is James saying, when that isn't present, when that doesn't characterize your heart, when you doubt that, don't let that person think he'll receive anything of the Lord. Friends, clearly this can become a hindrance to our prayer's efficacy. Paul, giving instructions to those who would, as men, lead public prayers, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Doubting. Uh, That's a little different word than what is translated wavering here in James 1, but it, it certainly carries with it the same kind of idea. And I thought Brother Woods in his commentary offers some good insight into the word itself. He says doubting, and then he gives the... Greek term, he says, the chief idea of which, as used in our text, is inner debate. It presents the picture of a person who is torn by conflicting notions, now disposed to feel this way, now that way. It is, as Thayer remarks, quote, to be at variance with oneself. It's to hesitate. It's to doubt. And while it does not denote the utter absence of faith, it describes the disposition of a person who, at one moment, feels God will keep His promise, and at another moment, that He will not. God's purpose in bestowing wisdom upon His children is to create a better relationship between Him and them. And if His children entertain doubts of the truth and reliability of His promises, The atmosphere is one of suspicion and not of faith. So I appreciate what he said here. Surely it is idle for us to expect God to give us wisdom if we do not give Him trust. Maybe you can appreciate that could be kind of like a form of insincerity, right? Offering petitions to God while in our hearts, not confident that He can or will answer them if they are keeping with His will. Friends, that's what insincerity is, not to be trusted. And it's almost like I'm kind of conferring that onto God. I don't have confidence because I'm not sure I can trust Him. James just wants us to understand our prayers will be unavailing. If we lack the faith that God will answer our prayer, you know what that can also contribute to? Not asking God. Matter of fact, uh, we're going to go here, James 4, in just a moment. Matter of fact, you, you can go ahead and turn. Over in James 4, we read earlier uh, part of, uh, I think it was verse, verse 3. Uh, but uh, at the end of verse 2, notice what he says. You have not because you ask not. See, sometimes this lack of faith in God's hearing our prayers and and answering our prayers, if we lack that faith, you know what that could translate into? We don't ask God. And James says sometimes that's the problem. You don't receive because you're not willing to ask. Not willing to ask. So friends, in either of these ways, our prayers will be unavailing. Either because we lack the faith to ask God, Or in asking, we lack the confidence that He will actually answer them. Again, whether that really is the idea of insincerity, I believe it could at least be a a manifestation of that. We're praying to God, but we're doing it without really being sincere in thinking that He can answer it or will answer it. So, let us ever guard ever guard against this potential hindrance of prayer. And here's how we can do it. Always demonstrate a trusting faith that our loving, our infinitely wise Father will grant us 
those, th those petitions, those things which are according to His will. And at the same time, He is a loving and infinitely wise Father. And so we should have confidence that He's going to deny those that somehow wouldn't be for our spiritual good, that are not in keeping with His infinite wisdom. But the confidence that we have in Him should be, He will always do what is right. He will answer them. Yes or no, He will answer them as a loving, infinitely wise Father. We have to trust that. James says if we don't, we shouldn't expect anything from the Lord. All right, and then finally, uh, not only a, a lack of faith in the efficacy of prayer, James addresses, but over here in James chapter 4, now he talks about improper motives for asking. And I have to be, I have to be careful around here. Hopefully that will become apparent why as, as we kind of look at this. Look at the interesting and significant language of verse 3. We read the first part. You ask and receive not. Now, that speaks to the possibility, right, <laughs> of prayers in effectiveness. You ask, now we should be asking to receive, right? Jesus said, ask and you will receive. But here James says, you ask and don't receive. So he at least is holding out, he is presenting the possibility that our prayers are not effective. Thankfully, he goes on to add the reason. In fact, in the King James Version, what's the next word? Because. Right? He's going to supply the reason as to the unavailing nature of, our, of these requests. What is it? You ask and receive not, now the rest of verse 3, because you ask amiss. Amiss. A Greek word that basically means out of place. It's unbecoming. It's not befitting. So what James is saying is, you're asking for something, but you're asking for it in a way that isn't befitting. By a motive or for a reason that is unbecoming. Brother Woods in his commentary, he says it could be viewed, the idea of not only improper, but wrong and evil. But once again, let's go back to James. James not only tells us, or tells us as Christians, tells those Christians to whom he was writing, why it is that you ask and you don't receive. It's because of your motive. But now he's going to even get into what those motives are as to why it rendered their prayers ineffective. Do you see it? The rest of the verse. That, here's the reason. You ask and receive not. Because you ask amiss. What do you mean by that, James? Amiss in what respect? How was it unbecoming? How was it not befitting? How was it out of place? How was it even evil? That you may consume it upon your lusts. Friends, he here is telling us again that prayers can be ineffective if they are being ask for the wrong motive. If those prayers are selfish, if those prayers are intended for something to be used only for my own interests, friends, that, that phrase, consume upon your own lust, could mean consuming wastefully, to squander it. That's how God is perceiving the request and the motive behind it. It is so you can squander it for your own purposes. I told you, I've got to be real careful here. Can you appreciate that? Because we're talking about motives. Who alone can know a person's motives? Really, two people. The person and God. And so, friends, our petitions to God should be done only after a very serious, frank, honest evaluation concerning the motives behind them. Now, that would be true of any request, but don't you see again how susceptible we are in this area when it comes to material things? 
That's really what James was talking about. You go back. You go back to the beginning of that verse, of uh, that chapter. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your, mem- your members? You lust, you don't have, you kill? You desire to have and cannot obtain? You fight and war and you have not? Friends, typically, what is it that brings about such wrangling and, and conflict in people's lives is because we see something that somebody else has and we want it. Now, I don't know how that played out in, in the congregation. I doubt if they were killing one another. But it certainly speaks to, as James addresses it, really the underlying of all war. Why does one nation go to war to, with another nation? It's usually to get something that they have that we want. Whether it's land, whether it's political freedom, whatever it is. And so friends, this seems to be where James is helping us understand when you are asking God for something especially material, we need to be real careful. Real careful about our motives. And please understand, we're not going to deceive God. We're not going to trick Him. I'm not sure what efforts we will do to present to God by way of seeking His approval for our request. I'm not sure what efforts we would go to, but we should never deceive ourselves into thinking that God doesn't know the real reason. He does. He is fully aware of the motives behind our asking. And so I'm just urging us, starting with Mike Brand, I'm urging us, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to ask questions. We need to be true to ourselves. We need to ask questions like, is our request for this material blessing, whatever it is, is it prompted by a desire to glorify God? Glorify Him either through contributing to the expanse of His Son's kingdom, the church, Or maybe glorify Him by relieving the poor or in some way bless my fellow man. Is that why I am asking? Or, if I'm honest with myself, is this all about me? Is this all so I can use these blessings for my own selfish purposes? Contributing to my own ease of life, my own convenience. Is it primarily intended to promote my own selfish pleasures. God says that's like squandering it. That's like consuming it wastefully. Again, brethren, I'm not the judge. (laughs) i got to struggle with my own heart. But when we're petitioning God for material things, especially worldly prosperity, successful business affairs, whatever it might be, it demands our most careful attention in examining our motives. Lest, as here described by James, we ask amiss. We ask with the wrong motive, unbecoming, out of order, out of place. Because then, James says, you're not going to get your answer. I'll just conclude this by way of what might be a good example for us to at least think about. Look over in 3 John. Do I have to tell you the chapter? Look at 3 John. John is writing to a man that he identifies as the well-beloved Gaius. Don't know who that is necessarily. But notice his wish of verse 2. And no doubt, John, the apostle of Jesus, when he talks about his wish, I, I, I feel confident he's making those wishes known by his petitions to his God. And notice he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Is it wrong to ask for material blessings? Is it wrong to seek God's blessing us with good health? 
Friends, here we have the Apostle John asking that for someone else. But now watch the qualifier. Even as thy soul prospereth. Now step down. I appreciated some comments that Brother Woods makes in connection with that. He said, The principle is a recognition of the superior importance of the interests of the soul. The apostle was speaking in the spirit of his master's admonition when he said, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Having put first things first, It was entirely in order that Gaius should have health and prosperity. It is a lesson so sorely needed among us today. We should ever remember to subordinate the material to the spiritual. Never allow the world to gain precedent in our thoughts and lives. And here's what he kind of translates that into. He says, here is the standard by which we determine how rich we can safely become. Just so long as the soul prospers. So long one may be, or so long as one enjoys soul prosperity, his riches bless and benefit not only himself but others. When they impair spiritual health. And sometimes they do, don't they? Sometimes they do. When those riches, when those, that good health, when that impairs spiritual health, the interests of the soul demand, as in the case of the rich young ruler, that a surgical operation be performed and they be severed from us. But that takes a lot of wisdom, doesn't it? Friends, I would suggest uh, this is an area that demands the closest scrutiny in our prayer lives and maybe is the area that is most susceptible to self-deceit. Because again, how often do we ask God for something materially and then we're trying to justify why we need it (laughs) to a God who knows our needs and wants. He knows our real reason for asking. And so I just wanted to present these potential hindrances. They clearly are hindrances. I mean, I don't think that's disputable. James says, don't let that man think he'll receive anything. James says, you ask and don't receive. But then he supplies reasons. One has to do with a lack of faith when we ask. Confidence that God can or will do it. The other one has to do with the motive behind asking. Is it just for me? For my pleasures, my life, my ease? Or do I really intend to do good with this? So I just offer this by way of counsel. Again, first to myself, and then to you. I just urge us to always honestly, carefully look into our hearts, knowing that God is looking at the heart. It's not so much the words he hears. It's the heart from which those words issue. Sincerity, sincerity is a must in our approach to God. Jesus told the woman at the well, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. That's the right attitude and in truth. Inasmuch as prayer is an avenue of worship, We have to take that to heart. We have to make sure our attitude is right. And among those improper attitudes is insincerity. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, friends, that's the first order of business. Because again, um, if you're still in sin, we should have no confidence that God is hearing our prayers and answering them in keeping with our goodwill. Now, if you've been praying that you might learn how to be in a right relationship with God, well, God's glad to answer that. And he does. He tells us. Tells us in his word. Here's what you need to do. You need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus came from heaven to earth to die in our stead. 
so that we might have the hope of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Jesus also was raised from the dead. You have to believe in that. Believing that, then in faith, act on what He tells us to do. Confess it, repent of our sins, be buried in water by baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. When you've done that, you've obeyed the gospel. When you've done that, you become a Christian. When you've done that, you've entered into a right relationship with God, and now you, as His son or daughter, can call Him Father with the confidence that He will hear and answer our prayers unless we hinder them by sins that are unrepented of in our lives or maybe by insincerity.